There's a big trend right now in the bike industry of manufacturers using 3D printing in frame building. It's been pretty interesting to see how the application of that technology has evolved over the past few years. In this video, we're here in Portland, Oregon at the Made Bike Show, which features several of the world's top frame builders. And I'm gonna chat with some of the builders who are currently using 3D printing to see how the technology fits within bicycle design and manufacture. Is it all hype or does 3D printing have some legitimate applications? Let's find out. Everybody with Tyler at Bitchin' Bikes. Have you always used 3D printing? 3D printing's been a relatively new thing. My friend Nick here, he is our head engineer here, ah, okay. and uh, he's uh, he's really brought that to Bitchin' in the last couple of years. Where does 3D printing fit into the cycling industry? So I, I think there's a couple places. One reason which I really like is it can allow for ease of manufacturing. And so joining tubes is the difficult part about making bikes right. um, and doing it accurately and well. Mm -hmm. um, and ah. so certain things like dropouts or uh, other varying intersection points, you can design it in a way that it makes the manufacturing of the tubes much easier. Right. Uh, so like this is a dropout that Nick designed and it has a spherical ball in for the seat stays. Oh. So you don't have to cut a, you know, a curved miter you can just have a straight cut with a countersink and it will line up rotationally, um, have a little bit of fudge uh, nice. for different angles. The other thing too, you mentioned before, we, we make some titanium drop bars mm. and we join the top and the drops with a 3D printed corner. So that's an application where we can do something that just wasn't manufacturable before with that material. I Meaning you can't get that tight bend. You can't you you can't get the tight bend, at least not in any sort of small scale. And if you were to weld it together, which there are builders that that do a a, a mitered kind of coped joint doesn't come out quite as clean as you could design something from scratch, right? Gotcha. Um, so being able to design something that's an amorphous shape, fits your hand well, mm. that also is a socket. Yeah. So that it's easy to weld, it's yeah. easy to assemble. So all of those things coming together is really what makes it. Where else are you using 3D printed uh, stuff with your, so, with your products? So, for example, on our GeoShift bike here, uh, our GeoShift bike, one of the more elaborate <laughs> bits, uh, Nick designed uh, oh, all new internals cool. for this dropper post. And so this head threads into the post with uh, a dual chamber inside. Oh, man, um, cool. So there's a lot going on in there. That's something that you just couldn't manufacture, or right. at least not feasibly. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, 3D printed out of aluminum. The clamp is 3D printed out of aluminum. We would normally 3D print some titanium tabs, but this is a prototype. We didn't know where it was gonna go. So perfect application for a simple, somewhat complex thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it allows you to prototype a lot faster. Try so, stuff out. So much faster. Right. So this this project, we're pretty proud of this. This project, the, the concept of it came around six weeks ago. So we went from six weeks ago Nick and I were having a conversation and he came up with this idea and he got on SolidWorks and started going after it and we have a functional prototype within six weeks. So yeah, yeah the, right. the turnaround time for prototyping is just yeah. amazing. Here with Mark at Prova Cycles. We first introduced additively manufactured structural parts seven years ago now. So we're one of the first builders in the world to use welded um, additively manufactured parts. It's in spots which are quite difficult to design using conventional manufacturing techniques. So it's mainly around like flat mount dropouts. Yep. This this part here and then the drop chainstay yoke on the other side, they were the first things that we did in 3D printing. And at that stage it was in uh, 15.5 stainless steel printing. Not about using the tech because the tech exists. It was about trying to find solutions to things that were difficult to yeah to just right. des design around or manufacture with. We've just slowly added it in spots where we can change, like introduce like features that are unique to us that solve particular problems. Right. So like, for example, the top of the head tube here, so this bit's CNC machined, uh -huh. and then the top uh -huh. section is utterly manufactured and then welded together, and then we machine, like goes into the lathe, gets machined afterwards where the bearing goes. Like rather than printing the whole thing, like just printing the bit, that is really difficult to make yeah, in yeah. another way. So Yeah, one of the questions I've been asking people is um, for, for those of you who use 3D printing yeah. for your manufacturing, you know, when when should the technology be used and when really shouldn't it be used? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like our our philosophy is if if you can easily get away with something that's more quickly manufactured, yeah. then maybe don't use it for that. So don't 3D print tubes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, this is the bike that we've used the most printing on to date. So we have um, 
three large printed nodes connected by straight tubing. The most load in the frame is kind of around here. So the printing's really allowed us to distribute the stress from the like that comes in from the fork into the frame really nicely. So rather than having to kind of use gussets and things like that, we can kind of treat it more as like a monocoque frame, as like how you would make a carbon frame. So we're like inside here there's like variable wall thicknesses and there's extra um, like it's not just a shell, there's kind of like an internal funnel internal coming up from here and yeah, yeah. So there's, there's lattice and um, like internal tubing as well to like really, like, like we're just trying to get like a really nice change in stress as we come up to this right. joint so, and the printing just like allows you to control that at such a fine yeah. level. Now with those printed parts, when you design them in CAD, do you run the whole frame through like an FEA just yeah. to see where the stresses yeah. are? Yeah, so we do that a lot okay. um, before we do any like physical testing. Uh -huh. um, and it's about, not necessarily about looking at absolute numbers in FEA, it's more about comparing to something that we know works. So if you, if you have a frame that you know has passed like official testing and ride testing, you put it through those tests in FEA, look at kind of what stresses actually work. You can kind of like get a comparison to the new thing you're doing. Okay, and we do have we do have quite good numbers for what we should be targeting for stress to be below fatigue limits. So that does help right. with with the design. Do you print in house or do you? No, we, we use a company in New Zealand called Ram 3D, which were pretty much the first company in the world to commercialise additively manufactured metal. Um, they've now got something like 14 printers running all the time. So, uh, most of our parts are made on a Renishaw printer. The very first thing that goes in the machine is a, a solid machined titanium plate and then it screeds a really thin layer of titanium powder over that plate and then the laser comes and welds that powder to the solid titanium underneath and then comes back and screeds. Well, the, the plate then drops down the layer thickness which might be like 40, 60 microns, and then it screeds the powder back over, and then the laser comes around and welds the powder to the previous. So it's essentially welding, it's, it's welding it, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. No worries, man. Everybody with Mike here from Number 22. Uh, Number 22 is a, a company that uses a lot of 3D printing. So this is our reactor aero prototype. Uh, so this is a, our newest model. It's not quite ready for launch yet, um, but we do use 3D printing pretty extensively in the development process. Uh, we have for years, this is probably the most ambitious use of 3D printing in development that we've used uh, because it is, the entire frame is printed from dropouts to head tube in one single pass on a 3D print. What was really effective with that is that it lets us get from drawing to a bike that we can touch and hold and actually hang parts on um, much quicker than we normally could. For production, we don't think that's quite the right solution yet. Uh, one of the challenges with printing such a huge 3D print is that errors that happen early in the process, I mean, this is a print that takes several days yeah. to complete, right. and they can really compound by the end. Yeah. And so there's a huge risk to the print, and also it's just hard to hit the dimensional tolerances that we need uh, on such a huge scale. Right. Um, so where we do find 3D printing super effective is in a lot of our other models, um, We've been using it for production for the last few years on parts like our stems. So for our fully integrated cable routing, uh, we've got one in front of us here. We pass the cables internally through the stem. We can design the internal structure of that stem to be very strong, but also to guide cables through when you're routing and uh, to make life a little bit easier when you're uh, working with that stem. We also use it in our dropouts. That was one of the big production-focused yeah. changes that we made. So before we shifted to 3D printed dropouts, we would have a bunch of different CNC's titanium pieces yeah. that we would then miter or cut to or cut holes in the tubes for, and then weld together. And we would have um, you know, four weld operations all near the dropout yeah. and the brake caliper. Um, what happens when you weld is that one, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of care, but also it introduces a lot of heat and that heat, when it expands and contracts the material really quickly, results in distortion. And so it was really tough for us to keep the dimension tolerances where we needed it to be. The 3D printed part, we now print it all as one unit, and suddenly we have only two weld operations. Yeah. There's a lot less heat, it's a lot further away from the... Uh, yeah, the welds aren't at the critical point anymore, right? Exactly. It's just at yeah. the C-stay and the, the chain stay. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's a use case of 3D printing that's like not appropriate? 
It's a really good question. I think that answer has changed a lot over time. Um, we we had our eye on 3D printing for production parts for a long time, and we used it in prototyping. But we sat on the sidelines until probably about four years ago. Um, and largely it was because we had a hard time justifying the 3D printed parts because we could, we were really good at the way that we were making parts before. And yeah. so we would make parts out of you know complex five-axis CNCing. Um, we would be welding different sub-assemblies together. And so we were so good at the other manufacturing methods that we weren't using 3D printing in the way that it really could be leveraged. And so I think that's still where we see it, is there's a lot of places where you can ask the question, like, why? Does this actually do better than a CNC part? Does this actually do better than just a simple form? Yeah. Or is it just 3D printing because that's what everyone wants to see yeah. and it's exciting? Yeah. And so we want to be really careful to only use it where it's really delivering a benefit. And right. that's been our experience, is like, you really have to rethink the way that you develop the part. And you can develop things that are super structurally efficient in a very different way, but you do have to rethink how you make it. Very cool, well, I appreciate that, thank you. Awesome, yeah, yeah thanks so much. So, uh, Newhouse Bikes, they, you guys use a lot of 3D printed components in the frame, right? Correct. When is it appropriate to use 3D printing on a bike, and when isn't it really appropriate? It depends on who you ask. I would say I have a much more utilitarian approach to 3D printing, okay. so typically, 3D printed part is a lot more expensive than just raw material, even right. machining. Yeah, yeah. But it can save costs in time, or it can save costs in process. Like if you do one less process, then maybe it's more expensive, but saves you time, right? right? That's when I would say it's appropriate. Okay. And there's also things that you can't achieve, like geometries you can't achieve with machining. Beyond that, I would say it's mostly an aesthetic benefit because it's always gonna cost more to 3D print something than to use a traditional manufacturing technique. So where do you use 3D printing on your bikes? One application is the brake mount. So normally when you weld titanium or steel, it warps quite a bit. Uh -huh. And in order to prevent missile line breaks, we'll 3D print this section. The print itself costs, I would say, I think $140. Okay. If you were, and the equivalent, if you had machine bosses, probably around 30 or $40. So it's a $100 delta, uh -huh. but uh, it saves a lot of stress when welding these, and if the brake tabs come out misaligned, then your frame's kind of ruined, right? right yeah. So it's it's a insurance factor, it looks better, and the other key note here is like, when I design a 3D printed part, I don't try to make it look like something is not. It actually looks like a, like a metal piece. The engineer in me will say it's not important, but the salesperson to me says it's really important. Sure. And yeah, I would say like, yes, people do like the aesthetic of 3D printing. Personally, I feel like it looks like a carbon fiber bike, in which case carbon fiber bike's always gonna be better and cheaper. That's why I don't try to pursue it. But you know, people are trying to do cool things like number 22, they have an entirely 3D printed bike, yeah. but I actually really like it. So, yeah. you know, who knows, right? <laughs> You're also using it on the yokes too though, right? The chain stay and the seat stay yokes. Oh, correct, yeah. Right? The, the yokes, I would say, it's more because it's a, the chainstay yoke, that is kind of an impossible geometry that you couldn't get with machining, or you could, but it'd be a heavier right. or more expensive. Okay. Um, so that's that's a good application for it. Right. And then we use it on the Y yoke, yep. and I would say this is a combination of a time-saving measure and an aesthetic benefit, because ultimately, you do have to make something beautiful that someone wants to buy, right. and for us, this is kind of the signature design. So that's cool because then you don't have this, the really thin seat stays trying to be welded to the really thick seat post, right? Yeah, the correct. Seat yeah. There, there's a strength benefit to this as well, yeah. but obviously you can overcome that with design if you wanted to. Mm. Um, but yeah. Cool. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, there you have it. Pretty interesting to see how 3D printing, when used tastefully and purposefully, can actually improve bicycle design and make manufacturing simpler and more efficient. Now, if you're liking these videos from Made, definitely check out the playlist in the description for all the Made content that we've created. Thanks again for watching, and thanks for subscribing to the channel. If you haven't already, we'll see you next time.